from Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Welcome. Our guest today is Neera Tandon, President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Welcome, Neera. And on that note, we'll go to issue one, P5 plus one minus one. They are going to want to make a new and lasting deal. President Trump this week announced a U.S. withdrawal from the Iran nuclear agreement that was signed by President Obama in 2015. But while Trump says that the current deal is bad and must be renegotiated, most U.S. allies disagree. Britain, France and Germany had implored the president to remain in the agreement. The Trump administration is now working with its European allies to establish a negotiating bloc to push Iran towards a better deal. But Tehran says it has no interest in renegotiations. Pat, will Trump get this better deal? No, I don't think Rouhani can negotiate the Iranians under dictation from Donald Trump. Secondly, I do think our European allies are in danger of having secondary sanctions slapped on them, which could really damage the NATO alliance. Israel was green-lighted by Moscow, by Putin and the Americans to launch those strikes, uh, 70 hits in, uh, in Syria. I think we're on a road that I don't see how you avoid some kind of confrontation and conflict with Iran for the reason that Pompeo and Bolton and Bibi and the neocons and tremendous forces inside the Beltway and maybe Trump himself are anxious to confront the Iranians. Eleanor. Well, kill the Iran deal was the foreign policy version of build the wall. So he, I guess he had to do it. He has to fulfill these pledges to keep his base together. And it was a way for him to take another slap at uh, Barack Obama. He's now really feeling like he can do it all because he's had some progress with North Korea. He figures if he just tightens the screws on Iran, they'll cry uncle. I don't see that happening. This is a hostile act against Iran. It's a hostile act against our allies. And I think the president now uh, stands alone strategically. And he has now done more to destabilize the Middle East than when George W. Bush invaded uh, Iraq. It's a disastrous uh, decision. Nero, do you share that sentiment? I, I guess I would say, I think the, the global challenge here is that it's a deep divide between the U.S. and our NATO allies and our allies in the world. And I, I think if you actually look, about, look at what's happening with the rise of Russia and China being much more aggressive in the world stage, the fact that we're taking a series of actions that really divide us from our European allies seems to be a, a great concern. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's destabilization happening as we speak in the Middle East, but I think the bigger challenge is we just seem to be diverging from Paris to Iran, a whole series of steps mm -hmm. where the strongest alliance to keep the world peaceful is at its weakest point. Well, Trump and the Iran deal reminds me of Trump and Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, repeal and replace. Well, we have no replacement. No, we don't. <laughs> and we have no idea what to replace it with. And, and it finally died. And Obamacare is still alive. Now uh, Trump can can uh, discover that he has no follow-up plan for, uh, for for the Iran deal either. Iran is in terrible financial uh, situation. Rouhani's got a lot of pressure on, on, on himself to uh, improve matters. Uh, but, but that gives them an incentive to want to negotiate a, a new deal. But there's so many moving parts, right. so many different countries mm -hmm. involved here. Iran has to ha has to sit back and, and just see what the reaction you know, Tom, is first of all before they, they can they can they can make a move to back to the table. I've always believed the Iran decided they don't want a bomb back in 2003, and then they cut the deal and got a great deal. I don't think the Iranians are going to start enriching. Excuse me, the Iranians are going to start enriching uranium up to bomb grade at all. I don't think they want a war with the Americans. They don't want to fight. I mean, they've done okay as they are in Syria right now, but there's no question about it, your point. The United States chose its allies, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf Arab over its allies, Britain, France, hmm. and Germany. And it was a clear-cut choice, and we rejected the NATO allies. Yeah, the best mm -hmm. outcome here is if the deal stays intact with uh, Europe and, and Iran, although the president, if he has one of his rants and decides to sanction some of the companies that are doing business mm -hmm. with Iran, a lot of companies have backed off already you know, because they don't want a co confrontation. Airbus lost a $19 yeah. billion dollar contract for 100 commercial jets. You know, mm -hmm. he negotiates like he's still a New York real estate developer. <laughs> yeah, you play hardball, you get concessions, then you renege on the deal, and no deal is ever finished. 
and uh, you know it's the P.T. Barnum <laughs> style of diplomacy. Well, as long well, as there's well, somebody else his, to his, fleece, his, <laughs> his whole negotiating record, and art of the deal record, has been greatly inflated, mostly by himself. And now we can well, see this, this all <laughs> out. I guess I guess the thing we'll have to see though is it seems it seems the idea that the Iranians are going to renegotiate is a really hard one. They have hardliners in their country. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to imagine that they feel like they can do a deal uh, and, and that the United States will actually uh, follow through on a deal since we just had a deal that we pulled out of. Uh, so it seems a little bit hard no to deal. like well, and, renegotiate. And let me, we have no but, deal, the more pressure there is right. to have a deal. Well, let, let me speak up for the president so our <laughs> viewers don't think this is the <laughs> fake news network. <laughs> uh, one argument, though, would be that the you do see that internal economic pressure, right? The Rouhani knows he has to get something right. so that money flows in mm -hmm. and at the moment the Revolutionary Guard Corps are the beneficiaries through those European deals of billions of dollars of money that they then are, flows into terrorist groups. Rouhani after Trump has done this says okay he's got us over a barrel we've got to renegotiate it. The Revolutionary yeah. Guard which said don't trust the Americans they're looking like they were right I don't think Rouhani can do that and survive. Fars News, you've got to read Fars News. That's the Revolutionary Guard News. They're saying that. Rouhani, you better not betray us now. <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's my Trump. advice, too. Yeah. <laughs> the hardliners in both countries are emboldened. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Trump, Bolton, Pompeo, and uh, the hardliners in Iran. Eleanor, yep. What yep. a bunch. <laughs> if, if President Trump somehow pulls off a better deal, Nobel Peace Prize number two? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're, number you're two takes on a number of meanings in that context. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. All right. On that note, let's Couldn't get on. Couldn't resist. <laughs> okay. Issue two, three hostages and a summit. I appreciate Kim Jong-un doing this and allowing them to go. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un received presidential praise this week when he released three U.S. citizens in his custody. The men were flown back to the United States along with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo following a visit between Pompeo and Kim in Pyongyang. And President Trump also confirmed this week that which our guest Gabby Morangiello predicted last week, namely that Trump's upcoming summit with Kim Jong-un will be held in Singapore on June 12th. Eleanor, is North Korea playing President Trump? <laughs> it's so easy to play President Trump. I mean, here he is lauding Kim Jong-un for the wonderful treatment he gave these three hostages. One of the hostages, when they landed at uh, the Air Force Base, said he wanted to step outside. He hadn't seen daylight for three years. Mm. So uh, I don't know that it was all that great. But every recent president has gotten hostages released from North Korea. Right. North Korea keeps a stable of hostages right, right. to use as bargaining chips. It's only, only this president who has to offer up a summit in order to get to three hostages back. So, yeah, I, I but think... But what are your thoughts I, on the summit? I think, I think Kim uh, is the unbridled victor here. He's now leader of North Korea for life. And I think that uh, the president is now going to negotiate economic assistance. And look, I'm all for it. Anything no. to avoid a war. But uh, I don't think we should be strewing, you know, rose petals at Tom, the president's I, feet right. just I yet. Think, I think Kim Jong-un wants to be the Deng Xiaoping of North Korea. To, to be the guy who brought the opening right. was very tough on that. And I think he's, the South Koreans are ready with all kinds of concessions. So I think it's going to be a favorable summit for the president, but he is not going to get something he wants. He's not going to get a hard, cold commitment to give up their bombs or give up their missiles or to have inspections into these plants. In my judgment, what Kim's going to say is, this we're going to denuclearize down the road. We'll take this step. No more tests by us. No more nuclear tests. We shut down that site where we test these things. And now what are you going to do for us? Right. He's going to want it up front. But Xiaoping mm -hmm. had some issues, though, with the pushback from the, the, commun the true believers. Do you think Kim has an issue there? Uh, I, th I think Kim is the true believer. <laughs> okay. yeah. I think it's, I mean, the, the hard thing is not the summit, right? That's not the hard thing. The hard thing with the North Koreans has always been a year two years, three years after the summit, mm -hmm. multiple presidents have made some kind of deal with the North Koreans that they violate mm -hmm. years later. And given what's happened with the Iran nuclear deal, we're not creating a big incentive structure to actually get rid of your nuclear weapons mm -hmm. down the road. So I actually think it's great that there are three hostages released. It's good that we're negotiating and that we're not actually in a place where we're at war. 
I think it's a little mm -hmm. odd how praiseworthy he is of a murderous <laughs> dictator who kills his people on a regular basis. That's strange to me. But at the end of the day, uh, a deal is actually the, something we need to enforce years from now mm -hmm. when Trump will, may not even be president. Mm -hmm. And it, we are setting up a situation where we have strengthened Kim Jong-un uh, for years to come, maybe decades. Have you been speaking well, to John Bolton? I think Kim sees this as being the, the time. Uh, he's got South Korea, the, their current government favors reunification. Uh, he's got uh, uh, a Donald Trump who, who ain't, ain't going to give him any heat about human, ri human rights. Right. <laughs> That's one thing uh, that, that may be one of the reasons why Kim right. uh, is so eager to, to negotiate right, right now. And if, if the consequences don't come until after Trump isn't president anymore, why, is, why would he worry? Yeah. I mean, he, uh, he, has, he has enough. enough you know, keeping you know the, South Korean, the South Korean president deserves a lot of credit here. And one right. of the things he did is he gave uh, Kim a thumb drive that showed all the economic all the development goodness. in South Korea. And uh, with you a know, proposed economic plan forward and that you right. can you remake, Trump, you can turn Pyongyang and the country. Pyongyang is, is, not a, is, is actually a fairly modern city, but the rest mm. of the country right. is McDonald's desolate. to Moscow. But, here's what, but, <laughs> but the point is here that you get all that good stuff and the South Korean, they ought to lead the negotiations. They ought to give what they want to give and get what they want to give and decide it. But we got to have our own policy. If they give away the store there, Trump ought to use it as an opportunity to say, you can do that, but we're pulling American troops oh. out of South <laughs> Korea. We're moving off the peninsula and, and we're g no longer going to be up there in the front lines. We got to have our independent policy. Yeah. And I think you can see to South Korea their independent policy. Uh, I think having, having U.S. troops in there is, is to us what having nuclear weapons is to the North. It's not something that they're, they're going to give up or, 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 or that we're right. going to give up. It's a right. tripwire right. for war. Here's, here's exactly. an addendum question, though. Is this an argument when we come to the vote next week with Gina Haspel as the president's nominee to lead the CIA? Does this help the president to say on Iran, on North Korea, on China, on Russia, I need a CIA director or not? Mm, I don't no, think it affects it one no, way or the other. It's all about I torture and whether you think it's unconscionable that she cannot condemn torture. Mm. But you know, you don't impose, she disagrees, do you impose your morality on someone who doesn't agree with you, even though she says she will obey the you law as written. U.S. morality on an agency Why do you that make represents her us to the world. Why do you make her say it? Because if she doesn't but say it, we don't she think said, she believes it. She said, I'm going to follow it. the law. Isn't that well, good enough? And no. she said she wouldn't start it up again. <laughs> well, you, you, well, you that, must have that's a thing still for Ms. Haspel, my goodness. No, I'm, just well, well, I, I'm offended by the fact that you rub people's nose in it and tell them they have to say something well, they don't this believe. Is, this, this is, is an issue that Senator, <laughs> Senator Kamala Harris uh, uh, pressed, uh, and, and uh, the importance of this is that uh, if President Trump says you can torture right. or, or you will to torture, will she do it? And she said That's she would. That's the wouldn't. key question. Well, she and, said and I wouldn't put a plan have, like that in place. That right. leaves an awful lot of wiggle room. <laughs> I think she might double down next week in saying she wouldn't do it. What, Nira, yeah, what do you I think about Haspel? I, I think the issue here is this is an elevation, right? It's not, it's not that she had the position or she has the position. This is, a, this is the president saying, I'm elevating the particular person who was in charge of this. And I think a lot of people think that that kind of elevation doesn't make sense. It's See, she's done a lot of other things. It's, yeah. a, it's not okay. a statement. Her resume looks good. She's, I, she's I, highly I, praised. And I would say if, if they declassified some of the stuff she's done on Russia, I think she'd get a lot of Democratic and, and, votes. And who, mm -hmm. who is in charge of declassifying? CIA. It's her decision. Yeah, which mm -hmm. Patriot, right? A little and bit if of it, a conflict it, of interest Well, but there. if she's not That's declassifying. That's you wanted, Eleanor. <laughs> 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 All right, on that note, okay, make sure to follow us at McLaughlin Group on Twitter and visit our website, McLaughlin.com. Tell your friends to watch us there. That's important. And when we come back, prosecution walls and progressive donkeys. Hi, I'm Pat Coleman from Jim Coleman Cadillac. This year, we're proud to celebrate our 50th anniversary serving our customers in Bethesda and all across the DC area. For three generations, our family's been committed to being the best in luxury automotive sales and service. And we invite you to join us in celebrating the half century mark by taking advantage of our 50th anniversary specials all year long. We want to earn your business, and we hope to welcome you to the Coleman family because our cars are great, but our people are better. For more than a century, the Greater Washington Board of Trade has focused on growing our regional economy. We work every day to foster collaboration, build pipelines for skilled workers, 
embrace innovation and attract investment. We must think, plan and act as a region to better leverage our shared assets so we can continue shaping and advancing a vibrant regional economy for the next hundred years. Issue three, the prosecution wall. Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced this week and that the Department all of all Justice will prosecute here. all individuals who illegally cross the southern U.S. border from Mexico. Sessions has redeployed 35 additional assistant U.S. attorney prosecutors and a number of additional federal immigration judges. And Sessions was clear about his intent, stating, quote, If you are smuggling a child, then we will prosecute you, and that child will be separated from you as required by law. If you don't like that, then don't smuggle children over our border, end quote. Clarence, is this a courageous act to uphold the law or a callous act of inhumanity? Why is it that whenever we have a choice between something that, that is humane and something that is, that is brutal, uh, Jeff Sessions will go for the brutal side? I mean, he, he's got a, 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 a long record of this sort of thing. The problem is, uh, uh, yeah, obey the law. Uh, his, his approach is about 50 years behind the times. This, this, this is the difficulty. He says that we need this in order to, to, to uh, save jobs, etc. Uh, right now, uh, 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 unlawful immigration has been down and uh, uh, unemployment has been down as well. There's no real economic pressure uh, right now and there's never pressure to divide families. That, that's the kind of a policy that you really astounded me. America. I'm oh, sorry? I don't think you understand middle America. Middle America loves to divide families. I mean, we have no, a long immigration America, tradition they of They look at the border together. and they say, we got an existential crisis. We have an invasion of our country from the south. As Europe is being invaded from across the Med, it's going to define who we are by the year 2050. It's the most powerful issue Trump had going for him. Border security, no more invasions. We're going to stop it. And the more you get out there and look like you're tough and you're going to do it and actually do it, I think the better you are. That's the best issue well, it's the Republican it's, keep, it's keeping the base together, obviously. Right. There's no crisis at the border. There was no crisis with Iran either. Uh, he likes to make crises where they don't exist. Frankly, separating children as young as four from their parents conjures up some of the worst images from World War II. What are they bringing the World children to the border for? They're, well, they're, they're <laughs> children, for they're life. bringing them here for a better life, and they're presenting themselves in the, for homeland, the most part is it not? Legally, yeah. legally and asking for asylum, and then it goes to the courts, and that's a legitimate process that we, uh, that we recognize in this country. I guess I, I'd say, I think, look, if if this issue was so salient, why didn't Republicans actually do anything to really push the wall on Congress? And I think the reason why he's doing these actions is because he didn't get the wall. He the Republicans control Congress; they didn't give him a wall, no. and they and he's now saying he's going to try to take these rough, t rough, tough actions, sort of just because he can't get that. Well, many, his base. I think many Republicans agree with you. Basically, they don't want the wall, and they don't. It makes them look insensitive and all the rest of it. We haven't got the money look, either. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't get control of your borders, you're not going to have a country anymore. Look down oh, the road. We, have, we got control. Decades. We got control. We, we don't need a wall to have control. <laughs> we got electronic surveillance. Sure. We've got motion detectors. We, we've got troops on the border. We've got control of our borders, Pat. Well, that's just a, a wonderful rhetorical device. But look, device, here, but let's start. talk about getting sanctuary. They're, what do you mean political asylum? They come through Mexico. They, is Mexico a repressive, brutal government? I would say you got a policy. If you're in, for example, Zimbabwe, okay, and you want to get out, once you get to South Africa, well, you're no longer repressed. Why don't you try maybe some young people you know and ask them if they'd like to go to El Salvador or Guatemala and deal with the gang violence there? There are people legitimately Look, terrified well, for their Well, when they get lives. to Mexico, do they got to deal with the gang violence from MS-13 there? Well, MS-13 was formed <laughs> by, <laughs> by, 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 an, by Salvadorans who were, who were Well, let, let, me, it, it, let, let me ask to, to maybe bring a little bit of balance. Isn't there an argument, though, to the more liberal members of the panel here, which oh. might slightly outnumber Pat? But, uh, <laughs> that, 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 but the, never outgunned, though, Pat, right, Pat? No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I always tell us that the viewers who worry about that. But, it, but the uh, operative point, perhaps, though, Clarence, is that Ultimately, the choice to bring children illegally across the border is the parents. Is it not their responsibility? If they don't want to be separated, don't do it. 
Well, that's nice to say uh, uh, up front, but it, it, it's still, when you try to execute it, though, it's an inhumane policy. It's, I, yes. we, we, I guess we have a history the in this country of keeping is, families together for a very good reason. You mean if these, family many of these shows up, let's 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 Lots of people are coming through. I mean, first of all, all this immigration is down. But for those who are coming, they're facing a choice, which is they're thinking they're going to die in their home country or come here with their children. And I think. Uh, we as an advanced, civilized country can figure out but how I, we address this problem well, let, let without breaking the you. family together. I understand your views on immigration, but, but why the idea you, why is look, why would you say to parents, why would you take a four-year-old, put them in foster care as your response right. to this, which is what John Kelly's response. I would Kelly's tell the family if they're in, let's say, El Salvador is the country that's the problem. You've moved up to Nicaragua on your way into Mexico, you are now no longer in the same situation. You don't automatically, because you're repressed, have a right to leave Bangladesh. I, right, well, that's what the States. Statue of Liberty was saying. <laughs> Hold on, one second. The U.S. government shouldn't <laughs> brutally treat children no. for the acts of their parents. What do the Mexicans <laughs> do? They're coming all the way through a thousand miles through Mexico. Why doesn't Mexico give them sanctuary? Actually, you know, <laughs> as you probably know, Mexico has taken in many of these folks. They should right. take in more. The question here is, what is the U.S. <laughs> policy response? Right. Well, look, all right, all right, yeah, we'll, get up, we'll get on to, sorry, yeah. Eleanor. We take well, this. <laughs> we we argue this. Say, we've taken the fewest refugees in Eleanor, Eleanor, Eleanor. There are more myths here about immigration being cited, this notion of our nature of the country yeah. changing. This is all, all right. new blood for the country. Right. And, and the chief of staff, John it's Kelly. It's new blood for the Democratic Party. The G- and large is that what the- you're really worried about? Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, not right. Only oh, right. oh, oh, because they were abandoned by the John Republican Kelly, Party. John Kelly basically gave voice to the, he said, these people come, they're rural, they don't have educations, they can't assimilate. Wrong. These are exactly the people we need to assimilate, well, they, and we need. We have jobs. We have to get on. We should have somebody from corporate America sit here and tell us how much they need immigration. But, you know, every, but the vast majority Quickly. of them consume far more in welfare benefits. That's, That's true. true. Right. Hey, hard work. Moving on. <laughs> the commander is taking control. Issue four: <laughs> making the, the donkey progressive. Liberal, liberal moderator here. <laughs> Liberal activists and politicians will gather in Washington next week to stake their territory in the run-up to November's midterm elections. Arranged by Liberal Think Tank, the Center for American Progress, the 2018 Ideas Summit will have four focus areas, democracy, the economy, race, and women. But for attendees such as possible Democratic Party presidential hopefuls Elizabeth Warren, Kirsten Gillibrand, Cory Booker, and Bill de Blasio, the question is how far to the left Democrats should go to win electoral support. Nira, how far should they go? <laughs> you know, the actual, what I see in the primaries happening over the last year, uh, Democratic primaries happening and special elections is Democrats are so hungry to win in the Trump era, they are going with the candidates who make the most convincing appeals about what they're going to do for the country, but also, most fundamentally, who can win. Phil Murphy, Ralph Northam, Doug Jones, Connor Lamb. Uh, this week in Ohio, Democratic primary voters picked Rob, Richard Cordray. So I think the issue, we'll see some of this on Tuesday, but I think people are trying to make arguments about what they can do for the country, but also they're also going to talk about what's their pathway to victory. So this is a realist cap approach, is it? <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad tent within the, uh, we have uh, okay. Doug Jones to Bernie Sanders coming. So, All right. Uh, I think, you know, is it not true, though, that each candidate, Don Lee and the others, they're going to pick the strategy that works best for them in their state or their congressional district. They're not going to have a group say, here is your agenda that absolutely, you're going to run on. Absolutely. So they're mm-hmm. going to pick that. So is the candidate yeah. in 2020 is going to decide exactly where he or she wants to position themselves to get the nomination and win the presidency. Yeah, but the people lining up for 2020, and there are probably going to be two dozen of them, uh, do tend to support free community college education for one or two years, uh, Medicare for all, uh, a big infrastructure plan, and I think those are all nice good. Tax those are all good, healthy ideas. A tax and, uh, uh, Re- Republicans actually, can't complain about tax increases now after this last budget that they passed. Just raise, it, I mean, they raise just, the taxes back to cover it. How yeah, about you know, a little uh, yeah, why is it gas tax Democrats? increase, which the Chamber yeah. of Commerce is for, a Republican entity? We we we, we need we need money right. to go other places okay. than that's the. Let's let Clarence expound on his point. We need more money. Well, Pat's absolutely right about about the need to tailor 
tailor your campaign to, to local interest, uh, to, to uh, the states, et cetera. A big internal debate for the Democrats right now is, is between shall we be uh, economic populist or shall we be uh, uh, cultural? Uh, yeah, yeah, cultural uh, identity politics, et cetera, as, as it is called. The fact is Democrats uh, just have to deal with their own diversity yeah. <laughs> and not divide themselves. This is, reminds me of 1992 when Bill Clinton unified the party after they'd been through the divisions of the McGovern era and the Dukakis era, et cetera, et cetera. The good so, old days. Oh, you that, yeah, <laughs> you, you love them, didn't you, Pat? All right, all right, okay. very quick. Yeah, just uh, no, Republic, no Democrat has lost a primary, no incumbent Democrat okay. has lost a primary, and Republican decisions. Okay, right. very good. Uh, we will be right back with predictions. <laughs> the McLaughlin Group is brought to you in part by Eric.org. With gridlock in Washington, states are stepping in to mandate paid sick and family leave policies, creating a compliance nightmare for companies with a nationwide workforce. The ERISA Industry Committee is fighting back Learn how we can help your company at eric.org. For more than a century, the Greater Washington Board of Trade has focused on growing our regional economy. We work every day to foster collaboration, build pipelines for skilled workers, embrace innovation, and attract investment. We must think, plan, and act as a region to better leverage our shared assets so we can continue shaping and advancing a vibrant regional economy for the next hundred years. Predictions back. Monday and Tuesday, real violence in yeah. uh, Jerusalem and uh, Palestinians, Israelis, they at me Napka Day and 70th anniversary in the American Embassy. Hopefully it won't be too wild. Eleanor. Mm -hmm. For all of Trump's tough talk about bringing down prescription drug prices, uh, his, the package that he proposed uh, just tweaks around the edges. He backed away from challenging Congress to allow the government to negotiate lower drug prices. Big win for Big Pharma. Nira. At CAP's Ideas Conference on Tuesday, it'll be a big focus on economics, and I think you'll see big differences between approaches between people who, who will be running in 2020. It, uh, big differences on at the on, summit? At the, at big difference in approaches on how okay. to, how to, how to, for Democrats Interesting. Mm -hmm. Clarence. Uh, the uh, two singles that Kanye West uh, co coincidentally <laughs> released at the same time that he endorsed Donald Trump mm -hmm. have not done better than <laughs> most <laughs> of his singles, singles have in the past. Right. This, is, this is not Sgt. Pepper to be kind, mm -hmm. and I predict that <laughs> it'll be basically uh, a mediocre rollout. Where can okay. I get one, Clarence? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wait, Apple, I, I Apple iTunes, I, right ahead. <laughs> I, I predict Kim Jong-un will offer a great deal to President Trump at the Two Leaders Summit in Singapore, and hopefully the Singapore government will fly us out there. But when it actually comes to dismantling his nuclear and ballistic missile programs, Kim will prevaricate. And here's a random fact. 60 years ago today, Vice President Richard Nixon, who Pat knows, his motorcade was attacked by a mob in Caracas, Venezuela. Nixon was almost killed when Venezuelan police officers failed to clear the crowd. His small secret service detail, however, saved the future president and embodied the agency's enduring motto, worthy of trust and confidence. We hope you'll join us next week. Make sure to visit our website, mclaughlin.com, where you can watch this show and all other shows. And we would be grateful if you would recommend us to your friends. Annyeong.